My name is Lori Pratico. If you don't know me, um, I am a Broward County artist. Um, I am a muralist. I am nationally recognized for my murals. I have murals in 15 states. Um, I also do commercial murals. And if you like to go out and get a drink or go get something to eat in downtown Fort Lauderdale or any of the greater Fort La Lauderdale areas, you've probably seen my work. Um, I have quite a few restaurants and bars and hair salons and different places that I that my work has shown. Um, and what I really wanted this talk to be about was um, I wanted it to be inspiring. So I start every day by saying the three words to myself that I want to be. And those things are confident, inspiring and empowering. And if I go through my day and feel like I was those three things, then I feel like I was my best self. Um, it takes some confidence to sit here and look at a screen with my face as the only one moving. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's not the easiest thing to talk into this thing for an hour and just see myself. Um, but I do appreciate you being here and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and so I can just pull up a couple slides. You'll see some of my work. Um, the best place to really see my work is on Instagram. Um, you can follow me on Instagram under Lori Pratico. Uh, the spelling, if you hit the little box with my name on it is right there. This mural behind me is um, what I call the together mural. Um, it's actually in Broward County on Oakland Park Boulevard. And um, this was done during the pandemic. And I'm super proud of it just because it's really about representing everyone and how we all really need to work together, especially in this difficult time. So what I really wanted this talk to be about was how, how somebody like me has had the kind of success that I've had um, as an artist and really as a human being. Um, as you can see, I am a co-author of a new book um, that just came out a few months ago called The Nonprofit Legacy. And it actually was just about a year ago that I spoke. It was the last event I spoke it live at. Um, it was one of Evan's events, the host that just introduced me. And um, I had said at the end of the event, that one of my goals was to write a book and I had not started a book. I had not um, really had, hadn't done anything, any writing yet. And lo and behold, I was able to co-author a book with 12 other amazing nonprofit owners. Um, and this book is available on my website, uh, girlnoticed.org. Um, if you go, there's a, a shop, shop to support button on the website and the book is there. And it's really just the stories of, of 12 women who had an idea and made their idea happen. You know, that it, it, if I go back, a lot of things have happened in my art career and in my life that really shouldn't have happened or, or you wouldn't have thought would happen, you know? Um, I wrote a couple things down, like, you know, how does a teenager with no formal art training end up being the only female billboard painter in Philadelphia? How does that happen? How does a single mom of twins who are in grade school, I didn't know how to drive or own a car, start my own business in the creative industry, and it was a successful business. How does that happen? Um, 12 years ago, I got the courage to show my first painting in a group show at ArtServe. And since then, in the last 12 years, I've had five solo shows. Um, I've had multiple galleries represent me. Um, I've created a mural project that spans 15 states. Um, my work has been published in Juxtapose magazine um, in Marie Claire magazine and in um, Professional Artist magazine. 
And one of my favorite accomplishments is my artwork is even on a candy bar. It's on a Hoffman's chocolate candy bar, which was a super cool kind of milestone for me. Um, so how do all these things happen to somebody who never went to art school, who was a single mom with raising twins um, that, you know, I didn't even really know how it was happening. And it was really by reading other people's stories that had success and seeing their success and finding out how they got success that I started figuring out, oh, I kind of did that too. Like, I, 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 I get that. I get that that those are the things that need to happen, that every time I've had success, I've done these certain things that, that made it happen. And it's basically, I've narrowed it down to five steps. And these five steps are gonna look different for everybody, but they're really, they're necessary in some form to get, take your idea or take whatever it is your goal is, whatever it is you're working on to the next level. Um, and I'm gonna kind of go through the steps and kind of, I'm gonna tell you right off the bat what they are and then tell you how they've kind of applied in, in my artistic journey. So the first one is to know your why. Step number one, you, you know, you have to have a why. You have to have a, what gets you up in the morning. What, what makes you keep going when you're hearing no's, when you're, you know, you're feeling like you really can't, can't do it anymore. If you have a strong why and you're really clear on your why, then you'll keep going and you'll keep doing it. Um, you know, when I got out of high school with no art training, um, my parents had, they, they weren't interested in sending me to college. So there was no support there. Um, I didn't know what I was gonna do with myself. All I knew is, is that being creative made me happy, made me feel good about myself and that whatever I was doing, I wanted to be creative. So that was my why at the time, was just that if I was gonna, if I was gonna like me, then I was gonna be creative in some way. And that's how I ended up as a billboard painter, is I just, I put myself out there and just didn't let anything hold me back because my why was that strong. Um, my why today is, is very different. Um, I still love being creative and I've been very lucky to be creative for a long time now, but I'm gonna actually read you my why. I wrote it down and it is, my why today is I want people to believe in themselves. I want them to have the courage to move towards whatever they dream of. And I want the underrepresented to feel seen and heard and provide them with that representation. That's my strong why today. And you might say, well, how come you had to read it? If it was a strong why, you would know it and you wouldn't have to read it. Well, my why, I can say what my why is in about a hundred different ways. I, could, I, I can explain to you, you know, what it means and what it looks like to make people believe in themselves in many, many different ways. I write it down very intentionally because I can look at this at my why and have it in front of me at all times. So I can start my day reading my why and start, you know, I start my day with looking at this and saying, okay, this is who I wanna be. This is who I wanna show up as. This is, you know, when I take on a task or I'm working on a project, is it in line with my why? Is it, is it, does it all make sense? Um, the clearer you are, the more clarity you have on your why, the, the stronger you will go towards what it is you want. Um, and, and I can't emphasize just how important it is. Number two is educate yourself. Um, <laughs> I say educate yourself, yet I don't have a college education. I went, I went through high school. Um, I, and my education though came from working. It came from other craftsmen who were doing what I wanted to do and me 
hanging out with them and learning from them. Um, from me doing and experimenting, really, my artwork is all about experimentation. Um, this is one of my pieces here. All the slides have my artwork on them, whether it be a mural or, or artwork. And, um, you know, this is on canvas. And the idea of the letters kind of you seeing through them onto the image of the girl and, and just the coloring and everything. I taught myself how to do that by experimenting. Um, I almost feel like I had an advantage because I didn't have rules. Um, I was able to just figure out techniques and, and figure out how I wanted things to look by just really applying myself and taking chances. Um, the other way I educate myself, um, at one point in my artistic career, my creative career, I decided that I wanted to be, I wanted to do decorative finishes because I knew that there was good money in that. And I needed to support my kids and, you know, kids are expensive. So I was, you know, I, I needed to make good money and I didn't know how to do faux finishes or to do any kind of decorative painting. Um, I had learned some things in the billboard industry that taught me how to do backgrounds and stuff. And I thought, well, why couldn't I do that on a wall? But I still really didn't know what materials they used. I didn't know any of that. And um, I would go to the bookstore and just pull a book out. I mean, cause this, <laughs> this was a while ago and you couldn't Google it and watch YouTube videos. So I would pull a book out in the bookstore and every book I could find on the subject I was trying to learn, whether it be creating a wood texture finish or you know, doing stenciling or creating your own custom stencil, whatever it was, I'd find a book on it and thank God there were books on it. And I would open up the book and sit in the bookstore and read it all day and figure it out and then try it. And 90% of the time I was trying it in someone's home on a job. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I was lucky enough to have that confidence in myself to say, just do, you can handle it. You can do it as long as you know what you're doing. And I remember I used to go to bed at night and I would play over and over each step in my head of how I was going to tackle a wall or how I was going to tackle a piece of furniture or how I was going to do this finish on whatever it was I was going to do. Step by step, I would go over it in my head so that when I got there, I didn't, I wasn't stumbling. I felt confident that I could do it. And um, it all worked out okay. So it, it worked, but I, that's how I educated myself was really through books. And it's still how I educate myself today. And I was not a great reader. And I learned from my dad. Um, my dad was severely dyslexic. And I think I may have a hint of that as well. I've never been tested, but my dad was, was he didn't get go past the eighth grade and um, he, he, it would take him so long to read like two sentences. And I remember being a teenager and asking him to read something for me. And he, it took him so long to get through the two sentences. And that was when I realized he had this issue. Yet he was, he could fix anything. And he had these encyclopedias in the garage of just pulling these books and he would, he would sit there and read it for hours and learn, teach himself how to do it and learn from the books. And so what it taught me really was, well, you, you can find out the information. And today we have so much information at our fingertips. It's unbelievable. I think to myself, wow, like what could I have done if I had YouTube when I was in my twenties, you know, I craziness, you know, but you can, you can go on YouTube and find anything. Um, that you need to know and how to do it and just just keep learning, you know, um, keep learning, number two. Number three is keep good company. Um, surround yourself with good people. Surround yourself with people that are going to lift you up and not tear you down. Surround yourself with people that are like-minded. Surround yourself with people that um, are doing the things you want to be doing. Um, if you're an artist and you want to take, you know, you want to take your art 
and and maybe have a gallery represent you if that's what the path you're looking for well then start hanging out in galleries start keeping company with people that are hanging their work in galleries um and you know there's a very natural way to do that you can't if you're genuinely interested and it's all in line with your why then you're going to show up and be authentic and you can actually be around these people and and learn from them and they'll the the energy that you give off is what you're going to get back um there's a woman in the center of this picture and kind of put my cursor on her i don't know if you can see that she's got her hands up like this um her name is taj and uh taj actually is the main author of the book i wrote so this this mural here was done in um maryland for girl noticed and the three girls on the wall were all nominated from their community to be noticed and this is what girl noticed is it's a mural project where i travel the country noticing girls and women um and they're nominated from their communities and you know that we had this like little block party and everybody came out and taj was one of the people that helped me organize this get together there and her girls from her organization got involved and we kept in touch and she's good company <laughs> you know she's a powerful woman who gets stuff done the woman next to her she's she's um the um executive director of cage free voices she's amazing too i keep company with these women and i keep in touch with them and we swap ideas and we we make sure that we know what's going on in each other's lives and what we're doing with our organizations and when she decided she was going to author a book and that she wanted it to be a compilation she reached out to me and asked me to co-author it with her and that's what keeping good company that's the result of keeping good company you know surround yourself with the people that you want to be around um and it makes for a much nicer day too. <laughs> All right. Number four, one a day. This this mural in the background is a mural in Virginia, also for Girl Noticed. Those were the four women that were nominated from their community to be noticed. Um, one a day is about taking one action, at least one action a day um, towards that why. You know, think about your why, think about your goal. Um, so my goal right now is, you know, with with the pandemic and things changing, it's getting, it's harder for me to get murals outside of um, Florida. And my goal was to get to all 50 states. So I'm thinking of new ways to, to bring this project where the, the really important thing about this project for me is the impact it makes. That's my why is, is the representation of women and, and the fact that, um, you know, making women see their value. So I'm coming up with a plan and, and ideas of new ways to present this project where, you know, a mural isn't, is still a part of it, but it looks a little different. And each day I take an action. I reach out to someone. Um, I write something down that that I need to do, and then and the next day I, I take that action. You know, so your actions are going to look different for whatever it is. But sit down and write it down. Sit down and write write your end goal down and work backwards and to to where you're at now because you can start anywhere. Um, Girl Noticed was an idea. That's all it was, was an idea. And it's now a national mural project, highly recognized. And there's, there's um, over 35 murals in 15 states. And, you know, it just was an idea. So your idea can become reality if you take these steps. And number five is get out of your comfort zone. 
this one is probably one of the most, I, they're all important. I really believe that all five steps, you have to take them in some form to get where you wanna go um, and to, to make things happen and get out of your comfort zone. It, it, it's amazingly important. Um, I'll tell you a story about an artist, his name was Larry Joe Miller, um, a really cool guy, uh, God, God rest his soul. Um, Larry Joe was one of the very first people to befriend me when I started trying to show my artwork in the Broward Art Guild and in ArtServe and places like that. He was very involved in Broward Art Guild. And um, he would come out and he just would walk right up to me and make me feel welcome. And, and he always did make me feel welcome. And he was just a super cool, cool guy. Um, he ended up having a, his own studio in Young Circle in Hollywood and he would do events and things. And he was trying to think of new and innovative ways to get the community to come out. And at this point, I was doing pretty well with my artwork. I was being represented by a gallery. Um, it was a well-known gallery in Hollywood. Um, I was selling artwork. I had been published in a couple magazines. Things were going good. This was before Girl Noticed, but you know, I, I was, feeling, you know, like I was doing well as an artist. And, um, and most people that are artists would have looked at my resume to that point and said, all right, yeah, she's, you know, she's doing really well. And Larry Joe called me and he said, I'm going to do an event called the Iron Palette. And I'm going to have four artists that are going to compete against each other. I'm going to put easels up outside on a stage and they're all gonna paint live. And I'm gonna tell you about five minutes before you start painting, what the subject matter is that you're gonna paint. Like I'm gonna give you a theme and you can paint whatever you want based on that theme. And I was like, are you crazy? There's no way I'm gonna do that. And he was, he was like, what do you mean? He's like, you know, come on, it'll be fun. You know, do it for me. Come on, you gotta come out. And I was just like, I was a studio painter. I did not let people see me paint. You know, I, I wasn't doing large murals in front of people. I wasn't doing, I wasn't painting live. I, you know, I closed my door and, you know, the dog had to be asleep for me to paint. Like I was not somebody that liked people to see my technique because really I felt like because I was self-taught maybe I wasn't doing it right. I liked my result, but I was afraid for people to see how I actually came to that result because maybe they think I wasn't doing it right. Or, or they, they wouldn't think I was as good as I, as you know, the, the final result was. They'd be like, oh, she does it that way. So I was all judging myself, right? And he's asking me to paint in front of people. And then I found out who the other artists were gonna be. And, and I was like, forget it. <laughs> Like, I really like those artists. They're really good. And um, I remember Joanna, Joanne Nava was one and I love her work. And I was like, oh, no way. And he just kept asking me. And because I liked them so much, I finally gave in and said, yes, I would. And I got out, talk about getting out of my comfort zone. I was so nervous and, and so intimidated. And you know what? It was a great experience. I won the Iron Palette. As a matter of fact, I have the Iron Palette winner award right here. <laughs> and, and this is this one, like I make sure I can see that because it means so much to me. Um, but I, I won the, and it didn't matter that I won. It was the fact that I went out there and I loved it. I had so much fun. It was so freeing. So much so that I actually created a class called No Fear Painting that was based on intuitive painting. And I would teach the class painting intuitively and having other people paint intuitively just because I had never painted intuitively. And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world that I could open myself up creatively like this. 
And it ended up leading to just so many unbelievable opportunities. This picture here, I was painting live at the Miami Boat Show. Um, and I was paid a whole lot of money to like just set up a couple pieces of plywood and throw paint at it and entertain these people. I painted at the Hard Rock um, Hotel and Casino for an NFL event um, where I was hired to paint. I've painted at various museums. I've, I've live painted in Chicago and, you know, able to do all of these things that had Larry Joe never gotten me to get out of my comfort zone and do that Iron Palette event, I'd still be locked in a room, not letting anyone watch me paint. So it changed everything just because I got out of my comfort zone. Um, speaking in front of people, not something I was comfortable with. And I have friends that could tell you that if I had to get up in front of three people, I shook like a leaf. And I actually enjoy speaking now. I enjoy, you know, I, I, the Zoom thing's weird, <laughs> but you know, I look forward to the day I can get back in front of a room full of people and, you know, share. And again, a lot of that comes from my why because it's all in line with that. I wanted to kind of give you an example of how these five steps are in like everyone's story. So I've kind of made it, you can see my shirt says her story. Um, I've kind of made it this mission of mine and of Girl Notice that um, to just hear more stories, to read more stories, to tell more stories. Um, and, you know, all of us know that March is Women's History Month. Pretty much everybody knows that. If I ask a room full of people to raise your hand, who knows that March is Women's History Month? Most people would know that. But did you know who Molly, if I said, who's Molly Murphy McGregor, I'm going to guess that 90% of the people, if not more of the people in the room would not know who Molly Murphy McGregor is. Well, I'm going to tell you this little story. I'm going to kind of read it to you of Molly Murphy McGregor. And I'm going to show you how these five steps all show up and they show up in everybody's story. And if you look in, even into your own life, you're going to see how those five steps show, have shown up in your life whenever you've had success with something that you were doing those things that I just laid out in some shape or form. So Molly Murphy McGregor was a 26 year old California high school history teacher in 1972 when a male student asked her a question that would change the course of her life. He asked her, what is the women's movement? McGregor did not know the answer. As a young teacher, I couldn't let the student know that I didn't know the answer. After school, McGregor consulted her college history text textbooks for an answer. Only one chapter in one book contained information about the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. I had read it before, said McGregor. I received straight A's in history, and yet somehow I had not remembered it. I had not even realized how much I owed these women. For me, that was the beginning. It was the beginning of McGregor's realization that women's narratives had been left out of history books classrooms, and the media. Women were invisible because their stories had not been told. It was oppression by omission. What I didn't know that day was that that moment of realization would set the course for my life's work. So Molly Murphy McGregor, that day that boy asked her that question, figured out her why. What I just read to you was her why. She returned to college at Sonoma State in the mid 70s, and she became very involved in the women's studies and a women's history slideshow. We traveled all over and each time we showed the presentation, we could see that people knew nothing about women's history. McGregor also taught classes at a community college where her students conducted a research project counting how many books about women were available in their local elementary school libraries. There were only three to seven biographies about women in each library. 
The real problem was that the books had not been checked out in five to 15 years. As a teacher, she knew why they hadn't been checked out. It was because the books had not been assigned. McGregor was also a volunteer on the Sonoma County, California Commission on the Status of Women. Okay, that's the next part. So you, what I just read you, obviously she educated herself. She went back to college. She started sharing her, you know, finding out, well, who, where, you know, who's reading these books, where, who has the textbooks, like, where are we learning women's history from? Why are we not learning women's history? She educated herself. So McGregor was also a volunteer on the Sonoma County, California Commission on the Status of Women. She spearheaded the idea of a Women's History Week for county schools. Curriculum guides were created and a celebratory parade was organized. We provided resources and the teachers could really teach it. McGregor said it was a way to introduce teachers to information they didn't have. So she volunteered and she got involved and she surrounded herself with like-minded people which is step three, keep good month, keep good company. So already she's done step one, which is know your why, step two, educate yourself, and step three, keep good company. In 1978, the first ever Women's History Week was held in California. So this story started in 1972. So six years later, the first ever Women's History Week was held in California and included March 8th as International Women's Day. And she is the one who organized this event. Organizers focused on women as professionals. We wanted girls to take math and science, McGregor said. They didn't understand how much they needed math and science to, do, to be admitted to a university. The first Women's History Week was a success and McGregor was hired as a projects director for the Sonoma County Commission on the Status of Women in 1979, just a year later. With the impetus to promote a National Women's History Week, McGregor attended an invitation only 19 day Women's History Institute for Women Leaders held at Sarah Lawrence College in Bronxville, New York. Dr. Gerda Lerner was chair of the institute. Lerner is credited as the single most influential figure in the development of women's and gender history since the 1960s. When I received the invitation, I was speechless, overwhelmed, and completely intimidated. She got out of her comfort zone. She was so not comfortable to go to this meeting. She didn't believe she belonged there. So that's step number five, get out of your comfort zone. Conference attendees included acclaimed women who were presidents of national organizations such as the Girl Scouts of the USA, National Organization for Women, and the American Association of University Women. I was one of the youngest people there and I was not an academic, McGregor said. Again, McGregor's mission to promote women's history took a giant leap forward. McGregor presented her idea of a National Women's History Week and the Women's Institute passed a resolution calling for its establishment. The participants immediately began using their organizational skills and political connections. Women around the country petitioned their governors to declare the week of March 8th as Women's History Week. And then she received a call from the White House. And in 1980, President Jimmy Carter issued a proclamation calling on the American people to pause and remember the tremendous contributions of American women and declared March 2nd through 8th, 1980 as National Women's History Week. Seven years later, in 1987, the, w, the NWHP successfully lobbied Congress to declare the entire month of March as National Women's History Month all because of Molly Murphy McGregor, all because she had an idea, all because one student asked her a question. And when she was asked that question, it sparked something in her that made her think, this is important and I wanna do something about it. And she had a strong why, she educated herself, she surrounded herself with the right people, she, she got out of her comfort zone and she took, I'm sure more than one action a day, no matter what. And she got <laughs> to where nobody even knows her name. And it's, you know, a lot of people know Girl Noticed, my, my 
National Mural Project. But if you say Lori Pratico, they don't necessarily know who Lori Pratico is, but they know Girl Noticed. And that's, that's all that ever really mattered to me. They don't need to know my name. I wanted them to know what Girl Noticed was about. I wanted them to know what the project was about. And I really do believe that anyone can have an idea and they can push that idea forward if they take those five steps. And anybody can do anything. I really, really believe that. And I hope after this talk that you're gonna believe that too. So I'm gonna unshare my screen so that you guys, if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask, they can. <laughs> I think you're three for three on the three talks that you've given for us, Lori. Oh. All three of them have made me cry. So oh. kudos to you on that front. Um, and thank you very much for sharing with us. Um, before we get to question and answers, there's one part of the story that you left out that I, if you could quickly <laughs> summarize, um, I think it was a really interesting part from when you shared at Creative Zen, the door hanger uh, experience. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that was that's so that's part of um, that's part of step four, one a day. That was part of the actions, action steps, right? So, you know, I wanted to have. I was. I started. Uh, um, a decorative finish business. And the way I did that was um, I had done like one little project and I was like, I can do this. And at the time I was a graphic designer for a printing company. So I graphically designed a bunch of door hangers for my faux finish business that I was creating out of nowhere. <laughs> and, and, um, during my lunch, I hung those door hangers on the community behind, I had a half an hour lunch, by the way, and I hung my door hangers on the community behind the print shop. And this guy called me and that saw the door hanger, he called me that night, it was a Friday, I'll never forget it. And he was like, did you leave a door hanger on my, about full finishing? I said, yes. And he said, I'd like you to come take a look at my house. And he wanted his whole house done, like every single room, he wanted a different finish. And I did it and I showed up with all brand new tarps and brand new brushes, nothing had a drop of paint on it. And I thought to myself, this guy must be, you know, he's think either he thinks I bring all new stuff to every job or I don't know, but it all went well, he loved it. And I made a lot of money. I'm like, you know, I actually took my vacation time to do the job. And when I got back to work, I gave my notice because I was like, this is what I'm doing. I hung 50 door hangers. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make 500 and, you know, I've got a business. So I literally put my kids who were in the fifth grade at the time, they were in fourth or fifth grade. I put them in the car. I had started, they were in the fifth grade because I started driving when they were in the fifth grade and I put them in the car and I would drop them off at the end of the block and we would each like work a side of the street and hang door hangers. And they would stop people. I mean, the, you know, people be mowing their lawn and they'd be like, this is my mom. This is what my mom does. <laughs> I would give them like a dollar for every door hanger they hung. And we did that street by street. And I didn't get one phone call. I hung 500, 500. And then I think I did another 500. I was almost a thousand door hangers and didn't get one phone call and it was the scariest thing ever because I was like oh my gosh I quit my job I thought I was going to be able to do this and nobody's calling me and then you know I hung in there just long enough you know like <laughs> remember being in tears at Pottery Barn because I wanted to buy a candle it was Christmas time and I wanted to buy a scented candle from Pottery Barn and they were too expensive for me. I couldn't buy it. And I was in tears, like, why does it have to be so hard? Why can't I buy a damn candle, <laughs> right? And then the next week the phone rang and, and 
one job led to another job, to another job, to another job. And this one woman that lived in a penthouse on the beach in Delray had me do murals all over her penthouse and, and do faux finishing and every piece of furniture I think I repainted. All because I took the chance, all because, you know, I hung in there. It's, it's, I got out of my comfort zone and I did it. And all of these steps, you know, I knew the reason I wanted to work for myself and that I was willing to do that hard work was because my why then was my kids. My why was that I wanted to be able to show up for them at school. I didn't want to be on a nine to five job where if one of them was sick, I was worried about, I didn't have family here that could help me take care of them um, if they were sick or anything. So, you know, I wanted to be able to show up for them. And I thought if I work for myself, I can show up for them. So I had a real strong why. Um, I educated myself in bookstores. I surrounded myself with people that would encourage me and not tell me I was crazy for kidding, for quitting my job. And I took every action I could and got out of my comfort zone just by doing it. And it happened. Uh, we do have a question um, from Mariana. She said, thank you for sharing. Can you read your why statement again? And how do you help people believe in themselves? Sure. So my why statement is, I want people to believe in themselves. I want them to have the courage to move towards whatever they dream of. And I want the underrepresented to feel seen and heard and provide them with that representation. So how do I help people believe in themselves? Well, like one of the things is like this talk, right? I mean, I would hope that listening to this talk, you see that, you know, I didn't have all these like lucky breaks. I didn't have all this stuff happening for me. I made it happen for myself. Um, I, I, I was in situations being a single mom of twins and, and kind of being down and out and, and struggling and, and um, you know, all the, and, and not having a college education and, and all of these things that, that could have worked against me and I could have used as excuses of why I couldn't be what I wanted to be and why I couldn't pursue what I wanted to pursue, yet I did it anyway and I am successful. And so when I meet someone that, that comes to me and says, and, and I do mentor people, um, that's one of the ways, like actual physical ways I, I help people is um, I have teenagers I mentor and, and, you know, I have people that'll just stop in my studio and they'll say to me, you know, man, I really want to do this or I really want to do that. And I'm like, well, why aren't you doing it? <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, what do you have to do to do it? And we break it down. You know, we break down, well, what is it that you need to do? And before you know it, they have action steps and your belief in yourself gets a lot stronger when you know what steps and what actions you need to take to get where you need to go. Um, because that that's what builds your confidence. It's like, if I go into, into a situation that that is intimidating to me without any preparation, then I'm going to, you know, it's, it's going to be a difficult situation. But if I go in feeling prepared because I took the action steps to prepare myself, then my outcome is probably gonna be strong and be positive. So, um, you know, I kind of just, I kind, a, lot of, a lot of how I make people believe themselves is really just by what we're doing right here is that you tell stories and you listen. I wanna hear your story. I want you to tell me what you've been through. I want to know who you are. I realize there are so many people, especially with social media today, that we just don't know who they are. We don't know their story. And this, and when we know just a little piece of their story, we know them so much better. Um, I see Ellie Shore's name on here, and I listened to her talk yesterday, and you know, I heard got to hear some of her story. She did a talk on here um, yesterday afternoon. And I got to hear her story and that was amazing. It was fun to, to listen to her and her name disappeared. <laughs> I scared oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, um, 
but yeah, you know, it, it, it's nice to, it's like, that's how we learn. And, and that's how it all happens is by listening to each other's stories and telling them. And I, I hope that, that I can help people tell theirs. Amen. And you can, and you do. And we are grateful for you for that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I have another question okay. from Jody Tanner. And she would like to know where you are currently showing. You mentioned uh, you have work in a, in a gallery. I know it's COVID times, but where are you currently showing? Um, I have work at ArtServe right now. Um, in the ArtServe gallery, they, they did a show. Um, and as soon as you walk in the front doors, which you are able to walk in the front doors, by the way, they, they social distance, you are able to come in. Um, I have five pieces that were all created during um, COVID since last March that are hanging in the gallery along with the video. They are all portraits of women. Um, I have two, I was in the middle of working on a project to recognize Holocaust survivors when all of this happened. Um, and I've kind of put that on hold. I did two portraits and have some video of the Holocaust survivors um, hanging in the show, but um, I had cre I was planning a, a large event and what one of the, I could still move forward with it, but one of the things that made me put it on hold was that the women that I'm celebrating, they are surviving Holocaust survivors. They are women in Broward County that are living in Broward County. And there are, a lot of them are in isolation. They're not allowed to, to leave where they're, you know, where they're living and they're in assisted living or they're in um, situations where they can't get go around. It's not safe for them to get out and about. And I don't want to have these events and them not be able to be actually physically a part of them. So I'm trying to hold off until I hope they will be able to do that. Um, but Understood. right now, yeah, that's where I have the, the work at, at ArtServe and um, I'm trying to think if there's anywhere else. I think that's the only gallery I'm in right, I'm at at the moment. Yeah, it's open. Well, if you'd like to feature some Lawyer Prodigal artwork or potentially sponsor a girl, a girl notice mural, where could they get in contact with you? Um, it would be great. Um, please contact me. Uh, you can go to my website, which is girlnoticed.org, and there is a contact page, and you can email me at um, info at girl noticed. Um, just reach out to me. Reach out to me on, on Facebook. Reach out to me at, on Girl Noticed on Instagram. You know, I get a lot of, you know, people reach out to me on Instagram. I got a mural in Utah that it was a girl that organized the mom show out in Utah that we connected on Instagram. You know, so Instagram has been a really great format for people to be seen. And, you know, you can take it a step further and get to know people on there as well. Um, but yeah, reach out to me however you, you want to reach out to me and I'd love to have a conversation with you. Well, we have one last question. And it was, what does a typical, I think she was gonna ask about a commission or what is your kind of process um, entail if somebody wants to engage you uh, for, for either a commission artwork or yeah, typical process question. <laughs> um, okay, well, it, because I do, do a lot of different things. So I have my fine art where I commission canvases. canvases so, um, you know, you can commission a custom canvas for your home. You can commission a portrait for your home. You can also commission a mural. Um, so it all kind of depends on, on what it is that you want. So really just reach out to me and give me an idea of what you're looking for. Um, and my typical process really is just to open up conversation. I want to, I'm out to really find out. I don't have like a format of this is this, this is this, this is this. Um, I really just try to be fair with everyone as far as pricing goes. Um, you know, if you have a lot of money, I'm not going to necessarily charge you more than if you don't have a lot of money. <laughs> you know, my prices are, are, are even and, and fair across the board. Um, but I will, 
help it make make it affordable for you. So um, often I barter, um, and then often also I will take a payment arrangements where you don't have to pay in full. Um, you can make pay a payment arrangements where you pay on a monthly basis if that's what you can afford. Um, I'm really out to work with you as an artist. Um, if you're if you're somebody that really is looking to have artwork done, then I, I would love to make that happen for you. And then if I think I can't make it happen for you, I have a huge community of artists that I will recommend someone that I think can make it happen for you.